a moment, recap where we've been in this series. Uh, last week, we talked about love and attraction. All of our love stories started with some attraction, right? And if you're single and you missed last week, go back and watch it. There is a lot of good stuff for you to become that person um, that God wants you to be so you can attract the right person. And if you have an older kid that's starting to go into this stage of their life, a lot of good principles that they can learn from that. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about conflict and resolution. If you're married, you know after about two weeks, there's some conflict. And we're going to talk about how to help, have healthy conflict and get through those things and become stronger together. And then we're going to end the series by uh, talking about how to have a love that lasts until death do us part. Um, but Maggie, hey, before I, I forgot to acknowledge that you're here. Isn't this cool that Maggie hey came everyone. up with me today? What's up? I guess it didn't embarrass him too badly first service, so he, thank you for inviting me back up here. Yeah, she <laughs> killed it last service. This is our first time uh, preaching together in nine years. How cool is that? Like, I'm so proud of, of her. We're excited about this. Um, but before we actually jump in and get to the moment you're all waiting for, um, let me just say, if you have not been to Connection Dinner yet, maybe you're, it's your first time, second, third time, or maybe you've even been around for a while, we want to invite you to be our guest. You saw the slide in the highlight video, but we'd love to have you at 5 o'clock uh, yes, this absolutely. evening. Absolutely. Come. Child care is pr provided. You there's no need to register. Just come at 5 o'clock. We'll, we'll, we'll feed you. I mean, I'm Polish, so I'm going to make sure that you will not leave tonight hungry. And most importantly, come to get to know us better. See what this church family is all about. Awesome. So let's talk about when things start to get physical, right? Um, and all the nervous laughter in here. If you, hey, student section, if you brought your parents today, this is probably the most awkward week to do it. Uh, <laughs> but I love it. Um, so when we were putting this together, it brought back a lot of old memories, in particular, a memory of our first kiss. Awkward. Yeah. So if you were paying attention last week, you know that um, I'm the innocent little one. So uh, we, we uh, uh, shortly after we started dating, we had the opportunity to um, go down to Croatia with some friends of ours. Just a few hours drive. We were just going to spend the night, hit the beach in the morning, come back that afternoon. Um, so that evening after everybody settled in, we snuck out of, uh, the place we were staying and made our way down to the rocky beach, found a nice boulder. And we sat up there watching the water and the stars and the moon. And it was just an incredible experience. Just the two of us. And if you were here last week, um, you know that pastor Chuck is kind of off when it comes to perfect timing. So this whole time, I'm sitting there, and I'm just thinking, man, he's got it all together. He's planned this perfect moment for our first kiss. This is just awesome. The ships are coming in from the sea. We're watching the stars, and nothing. Absolutely hey, nothing. I was getting plenty of action. I was getting my hand held, and I even got my arm around her. I, I was, was in pink heaven, man. I mean, it I was, was going to allow him to kiss me, but nothing was coming from his end. So I'm not the most patient person in the world. Many of you might know this already about me. Amen. So <laughs> as I noticed that, you know, he's winding down for the night, he's ready to go back. I just looked over at him and was like, are you going to kiss me or not? And I looked at her and said, uh, <laughs> can't let the girl down. <laughs> but unfortunately, I had no idea what I was doing because that was my very first kiss of all time took care of him so it was okay yeah and she unleashed the beast had no idea what she was getting herself into <laughs> but now we've been married for nine years we've got two kids so we have a little experience finally under our belt for this poor innocent american boy um but after we got married we found out pretty fast that we had different viewpoints on the role of sex in a marriage some of you guys probably found that out pretty fast too you see in my mind Man, it was going to be on, like, all the time. When you wake up, you get it in. Nope. When uh, you go to bed, you get it in. Nope. Just randomly for fun, you get Negative. it in. <laughs> nope. But for Maggie's perspective, why would anybody need something more than once a month? Probably should have talked about this beforehand, but... M maybe that would have helped. into it. But our expectations were very mismatched. Some of you probably experienced the same um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. In our culture, we're bombarded with all sorts of different messages when it comes to sexuality. 
We can't even go into a locker room without getting bombarded with a message. We can't go check out at the grocery store without getting bombarded by a different message. And, and God knows we can't surf the internet without getting bombarded by all sorts of messages. You know what I'm saying. And, um, you know, the fact of the matter is, in our opinion, we believe that the home and the church should be the most influential voices when it comes to our sexuality. Because we need to have a healthy understanding of the way that God designed it so we can experience it in its very best form. Um, most families, we're going to deal with it in one or three ways. And I'm going to assume that you probably had one of these three experiences. Uh, number one, being an open and honest where you guys talk about it and there's no awkwardness necessarily with it other than just the natural awkwardness that comes with it. Um, or maybe you grew up in a home where all discussion about it, it was very shameful, it was scorned, it maybe it was sem seemed like a really dirty thing. Um, or maybe you were like me and grew up in a home where it was completely avoided. My family, we've always approached this subject very openly. So sex was never, never taboo, starting from the music that we listened to on the radio, the TV shows we watched, down to the discussions at the dinner table. Sex and sexuality were always included, and we were able to just approach our parents with any kinds of questions that we had. My dad attempted to have the talk with me and my brothers twice, and each time he got about two or three sentences in. Um, as soon as he had to use anatomically correct terminology, the discussion was over. <laughs> Um, and to this day, we can't even say the word around my mother, God forbid. So we had a little bit of that shame dynamic a little bit going on. Um, but you see a pattern in the church, too. Um, in the early church history, there was a guy named Augustine who carried a lot of sexual baggage into his ministry. And really, he was considered the root of what, in our opinion, is a very unhealthy view of sexuality where, and, and it became the predominant teaching of Christian churches was that, that sex was a necessary evil. It was only okay for procreation. And, um, and over the last century, you've seen an American church where they've moved from it being a shameful thing to one of avoidance, where they don't want to talk about it. You know, how we can't talk about it in church, and it's just a very hush-hush, awkward, taboo thing. And uh, what we've seen from that is there's a lot of confusion and there's been a lot of unhealthiness in Christian homes and marriages and such because we haven't addressed it up front. Uh, but I'm glad to see a lot of churches are starting to tackle it on head on now. And as you guessed it, that's us. We're going to tackle it head on because we view it as a gift that God has given us to enjoy in the context of a loving marriage. And, uh, you know, it's something that God gave Adam and Eve before they were tasked with repopulating the earth, if you go back and look at it. Um, so we're going to talk all about this topic to this morning. We're not going to avoid it. We're not going to demonize it. But we want to have a healthy view of the way that God created sex to be enjoyed and used in our marriages. Correct. And before we dive any deeper into the subject, we do want to acknowledge that there's probably several of you this morning here that have experienced a lot of hurt and pain in this um, area. So we just want to let you know that, you know, God created so many different things and he meant them for good. But humanity, we tend to kind of mess things up and we use the things that God created for good and we turn them into something evil. So just for example, our cre creativity, we can create awesome and amazing wonders, but at the same time, we can use it for a lot of bad in the world. So this morning, if you are here and Man and women both are affected by this. If you have been forced to do something that you didn't want to or you have been abused sexually, just know that God is here this morning and he wants to touch your heart. He wants to heal you. He wants to restore you. So don't close off your mind. Have an open heart this morning to just experience the true origin and meaning of sex through this message. Amen. You know, we can enjoy it in its best form when we understand the way that God's created it. It's something that can enrich our marriages. It's something that can bring us a lot of joy and a lot of pleasure. Um, and what we're going to propose to you today is that when we do it right, we're actually honoring God by having a good and healthy sex life. Right. So we will be studying chapter four of Songs of Songs this morning. And... It's really a celebration of love shared between two lovers who are super excited about 
being able to fulfill each other's physical and sexual needs and desires, and they just really celebrate each other's beauty, love, and bodies. And they are approaching um, this topic with a lot of honor and faithfulness, which makes it so beautiful. So let's talk about great lovemaking this morning. Amen. And great lovemaking, and this might come as a shock to some of you, but great lovemaking starts before the bedroom. And all the ladies said? Yeah. Great lovemaking starts before the bedroom. And I know that men and women, we tend to have varying approaches to this. I don't want to pat myself on the back, but us ladies, we kind of just have this intuition where we kind of know that the physical intimacy, kind of, we need to lead into it through emotional and spiritual intimacy. So that's kind of how that starts. While men, on the other hand, well, men are, I mean, when are men ready to have sex? Or better question, when do men not have the desire to have sex. I why, don't know. Why are you looking at me like that? I don't know. You're a guy. I can't see the rest of you, so I'm looking at you. <laughs> so let's take a look at Song of Songs, chapter 4, and how Solomon approaches his bride and how he honors her and her body. Let's check out verses 1 and 2. He says, How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil are doves, and your hair is like a flock of goats descending from the hills of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep, just shorn, coming up from the washing. Each, even each, has its twin. Not one of them is alone. Now, as we established last week, there's some explanation that needs to happen in this poetry, right? I mean, ladies, how many of you guys want, the, want your husband or your man to compliment your hair by comparing it to a goat? Any of you? Didn't think so. So let me break this down a little bit. All right, it's probably their wedding night because her eyes are behind a veil. They're probably about to have their very first physical, intimate encounter. And um, Solomon starts off by acknowledging that she is revealing more of herself to him. In that culture, a woman would wear her hair up and often covered. And what she's done is she's let her hair go. It's like a flock coming down from the mountain, and he likes what he sees. And he's letting her know, I acknowledge that you're revealing more of yourself to me. And what I see is good. And he starts complimenting her. He, he notices the details. He's taking it slow and making sure to honor her in this moment. He just doesn't say, boom, let's get it on. He's taking it slow. That's something that, that guys, we could do a little better at sometimes. Let's just be honest, right? Before you get ready to make the move, Start by building emotional intimacy with your wife. And there's some very simple and easy steps to achieve that. For example, communication. I mean, guys, there's nothing sexier than when Chuck talks to me about his right. plans and his dreams and just the vision that he has for us as a family. I mean, that's how you build emotional intimacy, by just sharing your heart and reflecting together about dreams that you might share, goals that you want to achieve together. Another thing is just serving and ministering to one another. I mean, men and women, we both tend to be working nowadays, and we get home at the end of the day, and we're just tired. So guys, just, you know, step it up and cook one night or take her out to eat so she doesn't have to worry about it. Take the kids to bed. Amen. That's right. <laughs> but, <Give> ladies, <laughs> but ladies, honor your men, too. I mean, if if they're tired at the end of the night, give them a back massage or I'll take it. something. I don't know. Whatever they, they like. Cook something special. Like Chuck likes steak and ribs, so I like to make that for him. Dang straight. So we Guys, love food. Make sure that she knows that you're thinking about her. All right? We know that you're thinking about her all day long, right? Let her know it. All right? Shoot her a text every now and then. Take a dorky selfie and send it to her. She wants to know that, you, that she is on your mind. You want her to know that you are interested in her still. We tend to do really good about that up front in the dating stage, right? We're really like on point with this. What happens after we say I do? Guys, it's not okay to be slackers, all right? Let her know that you're thinking of her. And gentlemen, you want to take a pen out for this. This will change the dynamic of your emotional intimacy building. Something called NST. 
non-sexual touch. It really exists. All right. Some of y'all don't know what that means. All right. Let me take, break it down for you. It's touching without the purpose of seeing how far it's going to go. All right. That's a hug that doesn't end with a grab on the rear. Gentlemen, do you hear me? Yeah. All right. Your lady needs to know that you love her and that you are in her. All right. And she needs to know that she is safe and secure in your arms. Preach. And when I you wish my husband could hear oh, that this up. morning. <laughs> so she needs to know that you're in her and not just her body. All right. Non-sexual touch is a very important part of building that emotional intimacy. Solomon goes on in verses three and four. He says, your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like the house of pomegranates. Your neck is like the tower of David, built with courses of stone. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them the shields of warriors. What's going on is he continues to compliment her. He's not rushing her. He's noticing every detail and working his way down. He's getting ready for what comes next, but he's making sure to take it slow. Remember, if we want to have great lovemaking in our marriages, we've got to remember that great lovemaking starts way before the bedroom by starting to build emotional intimacy with one another. The second thing that we're going to talk about is great lovemaking is passionate. It is passionate. You see, sex isn't meant to be just this obligatory act. It's not meant to be something that's boring. It's meant to be something that's fun and enjoyable that you share together. And men, that's your cue for an amen. That's right. I see you looking at your wife all nervous. Um, Solomon goes on and you see where he's getting ready to make his move in verse five. And let's see if I can say this service without blushing. Uh, he says, your breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies. Solomon's getting, getting into it right here. here, right? Now, notice he's worked his way on down, but he's still complimenting, even though he's getting ready to go down to business, he is still loving her as it starts to get physical. Now, let's look at this analogy real fast, all right? Twin fawns, okay? Um, if you went to Riverbank Zoo, guys, and you saw a couple fawns there in the petting area, and you wanted to go pet the fawns, all right? Let me tell you what you're not going to do, all right? You're not going to run up to those fawns and be like, woo, all right? <laughs> you're going to come in nice and slow and nice and gentle. If you want to do something hard, go do the dishes hard, dudes. You did not do that the first service. That completely just threw me off. But <laughs> guys, be gentlemen. Treat your lady nicely and gently. And don't rush things. Don't be too forceful with her. Don't turn to a wolf. Like, just contain yourself and just treat her like the lady that she is. But then on the other hand, ladies. Just make an approach. Right. For the love of goodness gracious, sometimes try. make an approach. You know, um, I get it. In most situations, the guy is the pursuer of this, right? Not in all cases, but in most. If, you're, if your um, lovemaking life has gotten a little boring, it might be because he wants you to be into him. Your guy wants to know that you're still into him, that he's not the only one that wants to make an effort in this area. If, if this area of your life has gotten a little boring or obligatory, ladies, make it a move can light it up again. He wants to know that you are in to him. Absolutely. So ladies, don't just respond to your husband out of duty. It can be very discouraging to him if he has to beg for it and keep asking for it. Just show a little bit more initiative in this area. Man, I wish my wife was here. here oh, I haven't seen her this morning. I don't think she's here. <laughs> so anyways, it can... You know, if it just happens a couple of times, you might just hurt his feelings for the night. But if it's a reoccurring thing, it can really damage his drive and hurt his confidence ultimately. So show him that you love him. Show him that you're into him. Show him that you're passionate about him, that you're wild and crazy about him. I know, I understand we are super busy. I mean, I'm a mom, a wife. I work full time. So, you know, we just live very busy and hectic lives, yep. but if we don't make this a priority in our lives, it's just simply not going to happen. 
And I'm not going to cast any judgment, you know. If, if you need to put it on your to-do list on the fridge, put it on your to-do list. If you need to get out of your phone, put it on your calendar. Go ahead, put, get, get your phone out right now and put it on your calendar. I mean, I will put it on mine. I'm going to share it with the church's calendar so nobody calls us, you know. And, you know. But, hey guys, yeah, anyways, moving on. Make sure the environment's right. You know, um, if you need to arrange a sitter, arrange a sitter. If you need to take a load off her plate, take the load off of her plate. Light some candles. And I can't underemphasize this, that she needs to know that she's worth it, that you're into her, and again, not just her body. Solomon continues in verse 6. He says, until the day breaks and the shadows flee, I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense. He wants myrrh. Now, I'm not going to explain this analogy to you because we're going to get R rating real fast if we go there. But I'm sure you picked up like the first part he's saying. He's saying, I want you all night long. <laughs> um, don't settle for anything less than amazing. Your spouse deserves your very best in this area. It should be passionate. It should be enjoyable and pleasurable for both of you. If, if only one is experiencing fulfillment in this area, I hate to break it to you, but you've got a problem. Um, this is something to be celebrated together, not just individually, but together. This is you guys coming together as one physically. Um, if, if it's just not happening the way you, you want it to happen, talk about it. It's okay. But it's so important that, again, you build that intimacy before you hit the bedroom. But it's equally as important as when you hit the bedroom that it's passionate and pleasurable for you both. And that brings us to our third point that we're going to see from Solomon's story, is that great lovemaking is built on trust. As husband and wife, this is the most intimate thing that we share together. And as, with it being something so intimate and so personal, it has to be built on a foundation of trust. In verse 7, Solomon goes on to say, You are altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no flaw in you. Let's notice here how he respects her body. He keeps talking about how beautiful she is, and he calls her nicknames. He says, my darling. And if you were here last week, you heard that this woman has ex expressed some insecurities about her skin, but Solomon doesn't even touch the subject. He's just so captivated by her beauty, and he doesn't even notice any of her blemishes. And, you know, as ladies, we have so many insecurities. I mean, this thing is too small. That thing is too big. This isn't tight enough. This one has too many wrinkles. But it's just so important to understand that if we want to build this trust in our relationship, especially when we encounter each other completely naked, that we do not want to get called out for our insecurities. So guys and ladies, don't call out these insecurities. I encourage you to be captivated by the beauty of each other and just enjoy that moment. And fact of the matter is that time is our enemy. I mean, gravity is going to catch up with the twin fawns. I mean, he's going <laughs> to lose his hair, going to get a belly. I mean, that's just the matter of fact. So it's even more important to build that relationship on a great foundation of trust. Let me tell you, the most powerful way to build that foundation of trust is good communication. All right? As, as our lives go on, our needs and our desires change. And it's just part of the, th the uh, physical part of our bodies. As hormone balances change and all of that, our needs and our desires change. It's really easy to be complacent and just not notice the changes in our spouse. And it's really easy to not say anything about it. If we want to experience the best in this area, we've got to learn to communicate. I get it. It might be awkward. Even if you've been married for 30 years, it might still be awkward. But talk about it. Um, if you're going to enjoy each other in this area of your life for the rest of your life, you've got to build trust through open and honest communication. Gentlemen, when you're feeling frustrated and you don't feel like your needs are being met, you need to talk with her and not just at her. All right? If you're going to her and moaning and groaning and graveling at her feet, listen, your lady don't need a little boy. She needs a grown man. All right? Talk to her. Help her to understand where you're coming from because she doesn't get it, all right? Ladies, the same thing. He don't get it. I know you know that. All right, let me reaffirm that, all right? Communicate with him. Maybe he's doing something that's just turning you off or, or maybe the way he's approaching it is something you don't like. 
say something, all right? Communication builds trust. I don't care how awkward it is, but don't assume anything. Right, and let's also understand that if we don't build our sex um, relationship on the foundation of trust is that um, we just open our spouse up to a great world of temptation. We need to understand as men and women that um, our spouse, like we are our spouse's only outlet for this. You know, they, they shouldn't just be going off. I wouldn't want my husband going off to get his sexual needs fulfilled somewhere else. We are the only legitimate outlet for our spouse to find sex, sexual fulfillment. So we need to understand that, yeah, we yeah. need to just approach it through communication, through openness, through trust. And guys, you just need to make sure that your lady's taken care of emotionally and physically. And ladies, we need to make sure that he doesn't have to come begging all the time. So let's just recap it real quick. If we want our lovemaking to be great and exceptional, it starts before the bedroom. It starts with the emotional intimacy. But then it's also important not to forget about the passionate side. I mean, it's fun. Yeah? Amen. No, everybody's so quiet. It's making me nervous. Like, am I saying something wrong? <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. But then it's also important that we build our sexual relationship on trust. And now this leads us to our fourth point, that great lovemaking is exclusive. So let me just repeat this. Great lovemaking is exclusive. Amen. Let's read about it in verses 12 and 13. You are a garden locked up, my sister, my bride. You, uh, you are a spring enclosed, a sealed fountain. Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with choice fruit. So, all right, Shakespeare, what are we talking about here? He, Solomon is acknowledging that she has saved herself for him. And I know in our culture today, it's not a very common thing to save yourself sexually for your spouse, but we can see here the sweet and beautiful moment um, when we read the words, you know, a garden locked up, a sealed fountain, how she has waited for him. She has saved herself in this area for him, and now they're going to enjoy this moment together as they experience this, um, experience their sexuality together for the first time. Amen. You see, from the very beginning of creation, God created sex to be enjoyed in the context of a loving marriage. We see this all the way back with Adam and Eve. God said in, in Genesis that a man was to leave his parents to become united with his wife. And he said this, that the two shall become one. You see, we believe that marriage is a covenant. We don't believe it's a contract with loopholes and exceptions, but it's a commitment that we enter in with, with every intention and every bit of resolve to fulfill it for the rest of our lives. And when we engage in, in great lovemaking, what we are doing is we're literally physically becoming one, and we're reaffirming that commitment to each other. Becoming one isn't just a physical thing. Let me acknowledge that. It's not just a physical thing. As we build that emotional intimacy, as we build that spiritual intimacy and, and even mental and social intimacy, we're becoming one. We're becoming a reflection of the goodness and the greatness of God together. It's so important that, that when we view this area, that we're seeing it through this lens. This is a celebration. This is a gift that God has given us. Now, I know as we talked about this, some of you are probably thinking, well, they have some pretty archaic views on this. Um, and some of you may be offended, and, and that my hope, I hope that you know that's not our heart. Um, but understand that God's heart isn't to frustrate you in this area. He didn't create boundaries because he didn't want you to enjoy something. He created boundaries in this so that you can enjoy it at its very best. Um, you know, boundaries are there for protection. When we step outside of boundaries, we open up ourselves to a world of hurt and a world of consequences. Um, I mean, in this area, I mean, we live in a very broken world. We're all very familiar with the many consequences that can come from that. Everything from STDs to broken homes to, to a child that doesn't grow up with both parents. Um, God wants you to enjoy it in the very best form. He wants you to experience fulfillment in this area. But to experience it that way, we need to understand what it is. It is a gift to be enjoyed and passionately enjoyed in the context of an exclusive marriage relationship. You know, our culture says, try it before you buy it. 
Our culture says you shouldn't be exclusive because you need to know if you're physically compatible. Well, let me tell you something. If we make sure that we are spiritually and emotionally compatible, the physical part, it'll work itself out because God has designed it that way. Let me ask you, do you trust God enough to trust him with your sexuality? That's hard. I get it. But here's what I want you to understand. That when we honor God with this gift, when we build that intimacy up front, when we are passionate with our spouse, when we build that trust, and when we honor it as an exclusive gift between us, the fact of the matter is, we're honoring God. We can honor God by honoring his gift. All four of these things, not just one of the areas, but all four of them. We're honoring God when we honor his gift. That's our bottom line. That's what I want you to take from this, that we can honor God by honoring his gift. Would you stand with me as we get ready to close out this morning? Sex isn't something to be ashamed of. It's not something to be avoided. It's not something that, that we have to blush about all the time, but it's something that we need to celebrate as a gift from God, something that we can celebrate in the context of our marriages. And we understand that there's probably several of us here this morning and we just feel like, great, we royally messed up in this area and believe us we're not here this morning to condemn you we're not here to judge you we're not here to make you feel ashamed and feel guilty that's the enemy that's that's satan that's whispering in your ear you should be ashamed of yourself look what you have done you should be so guilty you should not be showing your face that's satan but god is here this morning he is here this morning right next to you and he's offering forgiveness and he's offering grace. And we are here to help. We're not here to judge you. Yep. We love you. And we want to point you in this direction where you can just experience the goodness that God has for you in this area. You know, we believe sex is something that's holy because God made it. God created it holy. And let me ask you something. Who makes something holy? Is it us? Are we powerful enough in our own ability to make something holy just by doing it right or wrong? We're not. It's God who makes it holy. So no matter what your past experience is, no matter if you have done it by the book your whole life, or if you're just getting it right, or you're, maybe you're just wanting to get it right, God is the one who makes it holy. God is a God of new beginnings. God is a God of new days. He can take wherever you're at and restore you and make it holy and let you be in that position where you can enjoy it to the very best in the way that he designed it to be. Remember, we honor him. We have the opportunity to honor him when we honor his gift to the very full. Would you bow your eye, or bow your heads and close your eyes with me? And I'm gonna ask um, that you, you really do close your eyes. You see, this area is probably one of the, the most sensitive and one of the most powerful areas of our life. Whether you're single or married, this, this has a very large bearing on our life and something so sensitive and intimate as that you know we we have an opportunity to really glorify God in a special way so here's what I'm going to do I know that there are people from every gamut in here and that's cool so what I'm going to ask no matter where you've been no matter where you're coming from okay hear me on this no matter maybe you've done it perfectly maybe you messed up the whole way that's okay all right I'm going to ask you something do you want to honor God with this area of your life? With no eye looking around. If no matter what your situation is or has been, from this day forward, if this is something that you want to honor God in, I just want you to raise your hand as I pray and agree with that desire. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Every eye is closed right now. Do you want to honor God with your body? Do you want to honor him with his gift? Amen. Thank you. Jesus, I thank you so much for what you're doing right now. Holy Spirit, I thank you. Lord, we thank you for the gift that you have given us in this area. We thank you, God, that you've created it to be a celebration of the two becoming one, of the two loving each other just like you love us. And Father, from this day forward, we affirm together as a church family that we want to honor you with your gift. We want to honor you with our bodies. We want to honor our spouse with our body. Father, we want to honor your gift, and we want to utilize it and enjoy it to the best that you've created it. We thank you, Jesus, right now. With your eyes still closed, when we talk about a sensitive 
anything like this, you may be in here and you feel that you need something more. Not, necess- not sexually, but you feel like you need the power of God to work in your life. You feel that I'm in need of Jesus. I need something more in my life. If that's you this morning, I wanna invite you to come home. Jesus came to this world. He lived and he died because he wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to forgive you every mistake and every sin you did. All you have to do is invite him into your life. If that's you this morning and you wanna say yes to Jesus, you wanna take that step and you wanna invite him into your life and start a brand new fresh life. Remember, there is no condemnation for those of us who come to Jesus. I wanna invite you home right now. I'm not gonna make you do anything weird, but I just want you to raise your hand so I can can pray with you and agree with you with what the Holy Spirit's doing in your life. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, I see your hand. Thank you, I see your hand. Anyone else, thank you, I see your hand. Amen, amen. If you were one of those that just raised your your hand, I want to ask that that you would just pray along with me right now. I'm gonna lead in a prayer and you just make this your prayer in your own heart. Jesus, I thank you for your love this morning. I thank you that you love me enough to come to this world, to live, die, and raise again so that I can have a relationship with you. This morning, I acknowledge that I need you, that I've fallen short, and I ask that you would come into my life. I invite you in right now, and I ask you to forgive me of your sins and help me to grab onto your love and your purpose for my life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen. Let's welcome them home this morning. That's awesome. Welcome home.